Clinton to be able to provide you an opportunity um, in this time of COVID to uh, do some of those things that each of us wish we could. Uh, I think all of us at this time approaching Holy Week um, anticipate and, and hope that someday uh, we'll be able to walk in the footsteps of the Lord through the Holy Land. Uh, that picture that stands behind me, I wish I was standing here on the hilltop overlooking the Holy City, but unfortunately, um, I'm standing here in my social hall uh, greeting all of you, uh, which is fortunate in the sense that I'm thankful that so many of you took the opportunity um, to support this effort, not only to join us on tour this evening, but also uh, to show your generosity in, uh, in supporting the FOCA uh, United Fund. Um, just to let you know, we've raised uh, uh, well over $2,000 for that. And in a COVID year with, uh, with no other opportunities to, to raise money and to do those things, we're very thankful for your generosity. Mm -hmm. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Father Ilya Gotlinski. Uh, Father Ilya and I, it seems that we have been friends forever. But for a long time, well, I think we were friends from a distance uh, through others in the seminary and, and, and things of that sort. But two years ago, Father Ilya helped my family and I and members of my parish fulfill a dream. That dream was to spend two weeks uh, in Russia uh, uh, where he uh, put together and led a tour for us, uh, patterned after very much what we wanted to do. Uh, and uh, we will never forget that tour. Father Ilya is the, is the pastor of, uh, I believe, Holy Door Mission, forgive me, Father, in, 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 uh, in uh, Binghamton, New York. Uh, he is also the, 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 the uh, proprietor and owner of Orthodox Tours uh, and has taken many, many tours uh, across the, the world, uh, but basically to Orthodox holy sites and things of interest to us in the church. Father Ilya has led many tours to the Holy Land. Um, tonight, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to give you that full experience of what a tour with Father Ilya is like. Uh, if you wanted that, you should probably start walking around the outside of your house now because they say when they go to the Holy Land with Father Ilya, they walk miles and miles and miles and every step is worth it. Uh, we won't be able to show you all of the Holy Land tonight. We hope to give you some of the key elements of the holy city of Jerusalem, basically surrounding the, to the tomb uh, and the Lord's passion and his, re and his resurrection. Um, so without further ado and without further hesitation, Father Ilya, if you would un unmute, uh, the floor is yours. At the end of Father Ilya's presentation, um, if you have questions, if you would kindly, um, because I won't be able to see all of you on the screen, um, if you would kindly private chat me, and that's St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Magador. That's how my name comes up. It's not Father Nicholas. If you have a question during the presentation, would like to uh, have Father Ilya answer it, send it to me in chat, and we'll address as many of those as we can. Uh, I'm sure Father Ilya has much more prepared uh, than, than, than maybe we will have time for but I'm also sure with his capabilities that he will give us the best tour possible uh, in the time uh, that we have to do so. So Father Ilya, um, thank you for joining us. God bless you. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Father Nicholas, for your most generous presentation. It's so good to see you and many other uh, dear friends. Um, I want to greet those who have celebrated Lord's Pascha or Easter already. And of course, I am wishing the most blessed reminder of the Great Land and joyous presentation, uh, joyous celebration, excuse me, of Lord's Paschal, Lord's Resurrection. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, greet you all and to be your uh, guest speaker tonight. And um, let me start with sharing of the screen and then we'll um, go from there. Okay, are you able to see my screen, Father Nicholas, or somebody? If you could please confirm. Yes, Father Ilya, we can see it. Thank you. We yes. can see it. Uh huh. All right. Yeah, turn the big chandelier off.
How about now? Is it full screen? Yes, it should be. I would assume so. Yes, it's full screen, Father Ilya. Uh, I selected as as an introduction. I have selected this painting by uh, Peter Bernard, a French painter of the 19th century, not very well known. In fact, known the most for this painting as I discovered it some years back, it struck me as very quintessential in the life of every Christian. Here we see Peter and John running to the tomb. It's basically illustration of the message in the gospel in John chapter 20. Early on the first day, of the week while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And uh, reflecting as a Christian, reflecting as a Christian pastor, I'm thinking this captivates the very essence of our faith. We're inspired by the good news of the resurrection of our Lord. And as his devout disciples, we do want to have this affirmation that tomb, essentially our tomb, because he did assume our death upon himself is empty. That we could partake of the blessedness that he promised to his disciples and was not very well understood during his lifetime here on earth. That had to be infirmed and reconfirmed. And it took only descent of the Holy Spirit in order for disciples to believe actually in it and to start going around the world, baptizing nation in the name of the Holy Trinity. It's a very captivating moment. And in a way, I invite you to follow Peter and John today in our attempt to see the tomb and as a mindful and reflective person to see what this tomb truly represents. So if we'll run after uh, Peter and John, we will... Uh, it seems, ah, forgive. It seems that um, we will enter the city, and um, what we what we going what we going to see where we going to enter is going to be an old city of Jerusalem. But of course, this is not the city that uh, Jesus have seen and what disciples have seen. The uh, city of Jerusalem from the time of Jesus have been destroyed during the Jewish rebellion of 70 AD and it would be uh, rebuilt uh, by Roman authorities only at the beginning of the second century in 135 AD by the Emperor Hadrian but nevertheless of course when people coming now there is very little even of that Roman and then Byzantine city that is left and what you see is really medieval reconstruct and for many people this is the closest as they emotionally and visually can get to the time to the time of our lord but what's very interesting that in many ways the streets of jerusalem remains perhaps um, the very same form and shape as the way during time of our lord most every street is a market and here you can buy some sweets you can buy some dresses souvenirs electronics fresh fruit uh, vegetables, dresses, um, school supplies for your children, uh, knockoff jeans um, of uh, famous makers, you know, makeup for women, um, uh, magazines for men, newspapers, uh, have a cup of coffee. So it's really have this very special Eastern aura. And it's probably like it was even during the time of the Lord, of course, with a different selection of um, uh, various goods for sale, but nevertheless. That gives you just the spirit of the place. But we keep running. And as we're coming through this maze of the streets of this very unique Eastern Mediterranean city, we're coming to the strange looking construct, which is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, or the proper and ancient name of the Church of Anastasis, or the Church of Our Lord's Resurrection. First, you're coming to the Parvis. Uh, Parvis is the open area at front of this uh, very intricately built building uh, from the time of the Crusaders, right? You're seeing this on this lower um, uh, right slide, um, uh, Romanesque facade with the doors that lead you into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You enter in, 
um, there is, you see, magnificent dome, and of course, the focus of our today's journey, the Lord's tomb, right? So this in the lower level corner of uh, your screens is what's considered to be Lord's tomb, rather chapel. You don't see a sarcophagi, you don't see uh, a, a tomb per se, it's really a chapel. So around that, all the joy and all the prayers are centered because of course on Holy Saturday, on the day before the celebration of Lord's resurrection, there is such mighty event as the celebration of the Holy Fire. Uh, many understood this event as purely miraculous, others venerable tradition that was perpetuated for thousand years and sort of took a life on its own. There are different opinions, but the most essential thing about it, celebration of Lord's resurrection, the brightness um, of it, the glory of it, the all bestowing grace of it. So you see the multitude of people who joyously celebrating, who uh, waving uh, packs of 33 candles, according to the traditional age of our earthly age of our Lord Jesus Christ above the head and they celebrate along with the patriarch who comes out of what is called Kuvuklia or Kuvuklia on this little chapel where the ceremony of the holy fire have been performed. But actually, what is the journey to the tomb? Just a couple minutes ago, I read to you about the holy mirroring women coming to the tomb. What they've seen, the empty tomb is actually of essence and this is a central key of the message. Illustration of holy mirroring women coming to the tomb is very central to the Christian iconography and very central to the Christian understanding. For instance, in upper left corner, you see a fresco from the one of the earliest Christian churches dating perhaps to the first half of the third century in Duro Europas in what's today war torn Syria and women coming to this tomb that just depicted as a white washed chapel, if you wish. And tombs indeed during the Jewish time had to be marked by either um, white color or bright yellow color to indicate that there is some dead matter is inside because of course uh, rituals and laws of purification were very important and people uh, had to be forewarned as not to come with something that would defile them and make prayer for a period of time impossible to them so that they would stay away from the cemeteries and graves that are filled with dead matter. But of course, here also an ancient um, uh, ivory from uh, Germany, from Munich, but probably of Byzantine origin, we see a typical Roman tomb that is not representative necessarily of the tomb of Christ itself, but it points to the Holy Sepulcher, right? Holy mirroring women coming and encountering somebody in the raiment, you know, let's say the, the angel or uh, who translates to them the message. In one of the earliest depiction, this is from San Sabina in Rome, wood carving on the doors. Again, holy mirroring women coming and encountering the angel. They will see an empty tomb, but not before they hear the message that they shouldn't be looking for the living among the dead. The message, and again, again, is being re reiterated in, in, in not only in word, not only in the gospel, but in the graphic art as to this most essential and central to us um, belief, uh, reality, um, uh, the entity that we would have to deal with, the, the new reality of an empty tomb and with burial shroud of Christ, as it is depicted here on the Serbian fresco from medieval period, um, that, that is all that is left of dead Christ in the tomb. But really, what holy mirrors would have encountered. We are so um, bombarded and overwhelmed by the imagery of the resurrection. And of course, most typical thing is very rather Western image of Christ as the magnificently shaped uh, and nicely built uh, man of many uh, sports and athlete coming out of the tomb that doesn't look very much different than our coffin with a flag. But it's a very late image. And of course, there were no tombs per se. Many people who are coming to Jerusalem, they do ask, where is the tomb? You show us the chapel, but we're looking for the tomb. We're very disappointed. We wanted to see the tomb of Christ, right? But let's address this issue. What was the tomb? 
as you see in these pictures here, um, perhaps that is the most graphic representation of how the tombs back in the day have looked like, because these do come from various places around Israel, and they're representative of that era and the fashion as to how the dead people were buried. And we would uh, remember the statement from Mark, and the, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spice and they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw young men sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were uh, frightened. And from the look, uh, it's chapter 24, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. So uh, here, right in the center, we see this rolling stone that would uh, roll the entrance into the tomb of the dead body would be placed in it. But here also we see the other types. And here is the priest and um, a, a very good man, a friend of mine, Father um, uh, Leonid, who serves in Europe right now. He's just given here for the size, if you wish. And here we see another type of a stone, uh, if you wish, like a cork that would seal the entrance into the tomb. That was, of course, done for the animals um, not being able to enter into the tomb and devour on the dead matter but also, of course, for the reasons of purification that would take an effort, even if somebody would decide to wander by chance, that would be additional guard for them. And those stones are pretty heavy. Otherwise, uh, unless the, those are royal tombs on the outside, they don't look very attractive. And usually they were placed outside the city walls. That was the rule of purification amid the olive groves on somewhere a little bit out of the way. And somewhere in the vicinity of the tomb, you would always find the stone of anointings. And these two ones are original. They actually cut from the same bedrock as the, um, the space of the tomb themselves. Tombs may have been uh, built in the former quarries where there were already a lot of natural openings. And on these uh, stones, the body would be prepared that usually had to be buried before the sunset. And no wonder in such a hot climate, body would begin to decompose very quickly. And those spies that we hear about in the gospel and going to hear during the passion readings, they were used to contain the smell of decomposition because it was so prominent, right? And the doors also sort of served for the purpose of preventing the door from spilling out. In honor of this tradition, that stone that you could see here on the lower right corner is a stone of anointing. And as you enter from this little square called Parvis into this Romanesque edifice from the time of Crusaders, first thing that you encounter the stone of anointing, but it's just a symbol. Uh, body of Christ have been prepared for the burial, but this stone is more of a recollection, an icon, if you wish. And even as you people come and venerate it, as we do venerate icon to give glory that ascends to the originator of all, of course, as the perfect definition of the icon, that is considered to be the stone of anointing of Christ. But it's a representation, however, based on the actual material, the actual tradition from the old Jewish time. But how tombs have looked on the inside? Most of the tombs were family tombs. Here we see uh, these tombs are uh, and a little bit polished, even with ancient mosaics on the floor. Over here, uh, the tomb was more or less uh, desecrated and lay in waste for a very long time. But all of these pictures are, are representative as to how I don't see Father Ilya. I don't know what happened. I do apologize. I get disconnected. Can you see my screen or not? Hello?
We lost you, Father Ilya. Do you hear us? Yes, I hear you. I don't know what happened. You know, I was, I don't kicked, know. Out. I was kicked out of the session. I do apologize. Just uh, if you go back to, um, you were talking about tombs and uh, stones, mm -hmm. maybe, and then you dropped out. So, okay. Um, if you, would if you, you can... please, would you please allow me to share? Because I guess I lost my privileges. Go ahead. Apologize. That's okay. Okay, I hope you could hear me. We can hear you. All right. So, but what actually, what actually would have happened? Uh, what they've seen inside the Jewish practice of um, um, burial was actually not in the graves per se, but those were in the tombs, and very often those were family tombs. Uh, here you could see uh, beautifully restored, or cleaned up, even with a little bit of ancient mosaic on the floor tomb. On the left-hand side, you can see an abandoned tomb, but pretty much based on the same principle. And I ask you to pay attention to what we have here in the lower left corner. You could see those little locally. And in those uh, uh, carved shafts over here, it is represented with the body laying being wrapped in a linen cloth or in woolen cloth or something of that uh, nature. Um, uh, uh, the person, when he would die, the body would be prepared for the funeral, wrapped in a fine linen cloth or woolen cloth and uh, laid in one of those tunnels. Uh, the entrance to it would be sealed and uh, at times a year later, or maybe if it was a family tomb, they would wait until all the openings would be filled and they would take a person out of the oldest opening, uh, would uh, clean the bones and put them in the ossuaries. Uh, the ossuary you could see here uh, in front of you on other imagery, and they would be put back in those little openings as well. So you wouldn't see the bodies in the tomb. You wouldn't see any uh, uh, burial gifts. You wouldn't see anything. And the body, of course, would be stripped naked when it's uh, covered in this linen or woodland cloth and placed inside the tomb. Uh, uh, tombs were, uh, uh, as I mentioned, usually family tombs where generations of people would be buried. An interesting thing that sometimes ossuary would be big and the phrase from the Psalms, when it's saying his bones were added to the bones of his fathers is actually is indicative of the burial practice where bones of one generation upon their death would be added to the bones of those who have died. From the gospel, we know that Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. In gospel, according to St. John, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been ever laid before. All right, and um, uh, further on uh, from Matthew, Je uh, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he, ha he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. We, we didn't have to suppose that Joseph did it all on his own. Um, he might as well have um, a lot of helpers or a few helpers. It really doesn't, it doesn't matter at this point. For us, there is this fulfillment of the messianic uh, prophecy uh, from Isaiah 53, uh, 9 is very important. They intended to bury him with criminals, but he ended up in a rich man's tomb. So um, this actually a representation of rich man's tomb and this tomb of no any other than Caiaphas himself, the one who took part as it believe uh, over Jesus, you know, that's how the rich man's tomb, again, family tomb, but rich man's tomb. Over here is also another rich man's tomb, if you can follow my, my cursor, the man is laid on the shelf at this point, uh, he's not even placed in this locally, but here on the right hand side, in the lower part of the corner, probably that's how the Jesus tombs have looked like. Uh, over here by fine white line, um, uh, this is the uh, shows the outer perimeter of the tomb. Um, of course, the outer wall for our understanding of the cave is taken out. So we can see here as, as a little vestibule 
and then entering into the tomb and Jesus a body of a man is laid here on the side shelf. Um, there were tombs like that and there are example of them like that but unfortunately then very dimly uh, lit circumstance and it's very difficult to make a proper picture but that what researchers and archaeologists agreed that's how likely the tomb of our Lord have looked like. Over here it looks very pristine it looks like something somewhat of a spaceship if you wish with such a fine lines and everything but of course it wasn't quite like that on, on the outside and we're going to talk more about it. So when uh, uh, Holy Mirbring women and then apostles, our favorites, Peter and John, whom we're following, came into the tomb. What did they see? They didn't see anything, but they saw, uh, didn't see anything much except for the burial cloth of our Lord. And here I uh, selected a few examples for you to have a little better understanding as to what it may have looked like. Of course, this is the more modern representation. Uh, in fact, used uh, times even for green, so-called green burials. And here likely how the wrapped uh, body of the Jesus looked like. In the iconography, like for instance, over here that you could see on your left-hand side, we see a Jesus burial uh, cloth looking very much like swaddling cloth. And that's of course is the theological parallel as Christ is called the firstborn of the dead as he is depicted on the icon of nativity, an infant being wrapped in swaddling cloth. So his death clothes were also in a sense swaddling, but in a different type. Here he was wrapped up in order to be born again to new life, to rise, to come back from the death and bestow this victory over death upon us all. Um, over here in the lower, in the lower right corner, what you could see is the um, representation of the shroud as it may have been placed on the body of Jesus. So in fact, the, here's a representation of the shroud of Turin, but burials of that type uh, are also very probable where well, long uh, piece of linen cloth or woolen cloth perhaps of um, some 12 feet, 15 feet, uh, 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 upon one side of it the body would be placed as you can see here on the lower part and with the other side of that cloth the body would be covered and it would be um, tied with ribbons so uh, as to preserve the integrity of the body and to allow and give a chance for it to decompose and sort of in one place so the uncleanness that coming of the body would be observed absorbed by that uh, by that by that cloth so when they came into the tomb we see very clear indication that exactly what they saw um, talking about uh, John and Peter he bent uh, in John 20 he bent over and looked into the uh, it at the strips of linen lying there but did not go then Simon Peter who was behind him arrived and went into the tomb he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus had the cloth was folded up by itself, separated from the linen. And here, what I um, using for illustrative purposes is actually interesting image, interesting images of two different artifacts. And again, we may look at the shroud of Turin from whatever angle we'd like, as the, with the eyes of the believers, with the uh, eyes of the skeptics. Uh, that's not the part of today's discourse. We could talk about the Shroud of Turin as a separate entity at some other point. But using that as an icon, the, a very graphic icon of our Lord's suffering, we could say that it's the most perfect icon. For those of you who never saw the Shroud of Turin, I would have to guide you as to look at. Over here, you could see a very dim face. Over here, there is a negative of it and how it actually looks on the Shroud of Turin. Then you see the body, you can see... Uh, right arm, left arm with the marks of cross, with the marks of blood on it. You can see two legs with the uh, remains of many, many um, marks of flagellation. And over here, you can see the back of the person, the back uh, that depicts our suffering Lord. Also, you can see multitude of those terrible strikes by the Roman flagellum all the way to his feet. And over see, we can see yeah, access of imprint of blood. So just as it is depicted on the picture uh, in, in the, uh, in, that I showed you a second ago, that would be a burial cloth, right? Where's the sudarium 
or the napkin that covered the head comes into play. It's very interesting that uh, most skeptics dismiss um, uh, Shroud of Turin altogether as absolute forgery based on carbon dating, based maybe on something else, although there is much that goes for it. But there is another very interesting artifact that is kept in Oviedo in um, Spain, and the provenance of that napkin is known from the seventh century. And it's actually the very napkin that wrapped likely the head of a man that is depicted on the shroud, whose imprint we have on the shroud because the markings of the blood and the imprints, there is no clear vision as of the face or anything else, but all the liquids, all the refuse that come out of the face, out of the nose, out of the um, mouth, out of the wounds on the, on, on the scalp, uh, correspond with what you can see there on Shroud of Turin. There were many scientific parallels drawn. That was the napkin that was put on the head of Jesus, um, even after his body was uh, in haste prepared for the burial so that no blood or saliva or sweat that comes out of the dead body would fall on the ground and by that contaminating it for the unknown passerbys. Some years back in Israel a grave was found uh, with the burial still intact and the man was wrapped into the two pieces of clothing uh, one went about his body and sudarium on the head napkin was separately over his head. So it seems if we'll believe the hypothesis that Shroud of Turin and Sudarium do belong to the saving passion of our Lord, that the body was wrapped in this long um, linen cloth. But in addition to that, the napkin would put about the head in order to prevent as faithful belief from anything coming out of the body of the dead master. What is on that napkin? What is the what is depicted? What they found in the tomb? It's all very closely related. It's the uh, image of the crucified man, uh, uh, gravely tortured, and then crucified. So there is uh, a discussion as to whether the flagell flagellation always preceded the crucifixion, or whether it was double punishment for the same seeming crime. Uh, it seems that uh, uh, exegesis. Uh, varies in that regard. There is a hypothesis that Pontius Pilate really didn't want Jesus to be um, uh, killed as he found no guilt in him. He was too weak of a man or didn't want any trouble to let him go. So he wanted to satisfy Jesus by, uh, wanted to satisfy Jews by beating Jesus to half death and then letting him go. But then there was an insistence of men to die. And uh, so Pilate wishing to set the crowd release for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified and they let him out to crucify him. All right, and uh, we see that encounter in all the gospels. We're going to hear the Passion Gospels on Holy Thursday. Then Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and went out bearing his cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on the on one side and the other on the other, and Jesus between them. And from the very beginning, there was a guess into which cru cross uh, Christ was crucified, because we know that crucifixion was a very prominent Roman execution. Over here, you see artistic rendition of based on very early artifacts as to how um, those who would be executed and granted non-Roman citizens. Roman citizens were never given a torturous death unless maybe the soldiers who deserters from the battlefield, but common criminals of non-Roman uh, citizenship, they were crucified and it was always spectacle made out of them. The earliest witness seems to come from the epistle of Barnabas. It's no earlier than 135 AD and maybe even earlier. And there is indication that there was belief that Christ was crucified on T-shaped cross. It comes in conflict with the inscription that Pontius Pilate wrote, the king, uh, the Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But um, the idea was more of a theological parallel that was the wooden wood erected by uh, uh, Moses in the desert and the uh, copper serpent that would uh, save Israelites from the 
attacks of the um, uh, venomous snakes. Justin Martyr, who certainly was a witness to Roman executions as he lived in the second century AD, explicitly says that the cross was of two beam shaped. Uh, that's a quote, that lamb which was commanded to be holy roasted was a symbol of the suffering of cross which Christ was, would undergo. For the lamb which is roasted is roasted and dressed up in the form of the cross. For one spit is transfixed right through from the lower parts up the head and one across the back to which are attached the legs of the lamb. Again, we see much more important the theological explanation as Christ being a new lamb, Christ being an ultimate sacrifice, Christ being an ultimate offering for mankind, not as much as a shape of a cross, but for us, it's nevertheless remains a curiosity. Uh, um, the, um, also in Israel, curiously enough, in one of the tombs, uh, a remnant of a crucified man was found. Uh, it's very diff different from what we see in iconography with legs of Christ being uh, attached frontally to the cross. But over C, we see the evidence for a man being crucified uh, uh, through the side of uh, his foot. And uh, when the man was crucified, the nail uh, likely struck a nut in the main shaft of the cross, and they were not able to pull it out, and the man was buried with his uh, nail still piercing his piercing his heel. So over here, there is a recreation, an anatomical recreation of how it may have look like because based on this example you can't say much and this is the earliest depiction of the crucifix so the gospel account is spot on in description of the uh, death of christ um, there are different representations this is perhaps the earliest and non-christian related depiction of the crucifix coming from italy from the southern town of putioli near naples um, over here, we see the man crucified actually with his um, arms tied to the cross. He is not, his arms are not even pierced. Over here, we see one of the first so-called Christian, or better say anti-Christian depiction, um, so-called graffiti of Alexamenus, where a, a slave named Alexamenus, who was obviously a Christian, was mocked by his fellow slaves. And it says Alexamenus believed in, uh, in a crucified man. And here Jesus is depicted in a mockery, of course, with a donkey head by non-Christians. But nevertheless, it's one of the first tributes to Christians existing in Rome, right? And here's the also a uh, very interesting cameo already of Christian nature of Christ being uh, crucified on the cross. Uh, so we see the perfect body of evidence from what gospel talks to us. Another interesting thing, but many probably of you impressed and thinking that Christ was crucified on the ground, as Mel Gibson showed in his otherwise very accurate in many respects movie, and then he was lifted almost above the sky and enormous height. Um, the reality is actually different crosses were very, very short, and uh, the man who would be crucified very often went up on the cross. Now, Orthodox iconography, curiously enough, preserved this particular element even, even as we speak and we know that Emperor Constantine outlawed um, crucifixion as an imitation uh, of the death of the Christ. Uh, so criminals could not be crucified because they're imitating the saving offering of our Lord Jesus. But nevertheless, it... Um, very graphically and very correctly presents of how the crucifixion and taking down from the cross may have looked like. Over here we see the uh, uh, descent of the descent on the cross by our Lord, and over here we see Joseph and John and Mary taking Jesus down from the cross before he would be placed in his tomb. There are also statements that in some of the stikiras or irmasi of the Passion Week that Christ sat on the cross. And that was also another uh, form of the cross where there was be a little sit or a nail, actually, that would support the main body of the crucified. And we have a witness in a form of St. Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon from the second century, who speaks of the cross as having five extremities, two in length, two in breadth, and one in the middle, on which the person rests who is fixed by the nail. Uh, you know, very interesting and intricate language 
for a crucified man, but nevertheless, that's very gory execution, you know, very dreadful. And prior to that, as the gospel relates to us, and as we could see from the depictions, and of course, what Apostle Paul of, uh, alluding in his writings and for all four gospels addressed, and what I mentioned to you already that uh, Christ was beaten pretty severely, and here we see Roman flagellum. Um, it's a stick with the uh, leather stripes attached to it with pieces of bone or pieces of metal. They came in different shapes of form, but basically when the man was beaten, it would leave a very deep mark. It would uh, uh, tear his flesh for sure, exposing the uh, basically muscle uh, to the elements. We don't know how many times uh, Christ was hit, but probably more than 40, because in Jewish practice, man could not be given more than 40 leashes. Actually, he was usually giving 39. You know, Apostle Paul would be talking about it, but Jesus was a subject to Roman law at that point, and he was beaten pretty severely. And was, here we see a picture of a very different man from a very different part of the world, but nevertheless, who have survived flagellum in time that is near us. Uh, and you could see that he have survived and he lived, it has nothing to do with the crucifixion, but that's what you could see what horror those flagellums would have inflicted, inflicted on a man for graphic illustration, what our Lord had to undergo. And here's a crown of thorns. Again, usually on much more modern uh, descriptions, we see uh, some a wreath attached to Christ's head, but in antiquity, of course, the crowns had a form more of a skull cap, and they were made out of uh, a bush with very uh, sturdy branches with spikes coming out of them, maybe up to two, at times even three inches long, that are very difficult even to break with your own fingers. It's almost impossible to separate them from the uh, branch itself, but those nails, they're almost metal-like. And uh, whoever made this scalp was, you know, devil incarnate. And of course, the minute you put such a skull cap, uh, it, it's almost, you know, permanently fixed to you because it really goes down into your skin, into your hair, into everything. And uh, this is the very faithful reproduction in one of the museums in Israel. And here are some branches of that bush or a tree. Of course, it's natural for the environment because um, it's a defense mechanism of um, uh, that particular uh, tree or a bush of that piece of vegetation to protect it from desert uh, animals and camels and donkeys from eating it. So, but here we're coming already into Christian era and St. Empress Helen, the sexually likely her life portrait comes to Jerusalem in early, uh, 320s on the command of her son, Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor who legalized Christianity in the Roman empire, who builds a beautiful edifice. But of course, first and foremost, he, she builds the first uh, chapel and the place of where Christ was laid. And uh, interestingly enough, we do have some representation that comes to us from antiquity. Uh, in the Lapidary Museum in Narbonne, uh, there is a poorly surviving, but nevertheless surviving model of the Holy Sepulchre over here in the lower left part. Here it is recreated by the artistic design. And here we see the pilgrim token with Holy Mirbering Woman and Angel talking at the front of the Holy Sepulchre. Of course, Holy Sepulchre depicted the way it looked during the Byzantine times. So from 327 AD roughly to uh, 109 um, with short intermission for uh, Persian conquest. We don't know how much damage was done actually to the tomb. Uh, that uh, Byzantine chapel was intact and, and 109 uh, uh, Islamic uh, Sheikh Al Hakim, he destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He was uh, not a very pleasant man, called a madman by his own. But prior to that, there were Byzantine Christian advancements in Asia Minor, and probably it was the vengeance that led him to desecrate, not only desecrate, but to destroy the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Church of Anastasius, and the Tomb of Our Lord. 
that actually survived Muslim conquest of Jerusalem in 636 AD. Uh, Muslims did not convert the Church of Anastasis into a mosque. That was considered to be the holy of holies. And if we have evidence from um, Eusebius, the church historian, who talks about the Empress Helen, um, that we, evidence or uh, witnesses written in 30, 30, 337 AD, and he called it the most venerable and most holy martyrian of Savior's resurrection. And his terminology clearly parallels the prophecy of Zephaniah. Therefore, says the Lord, wait for me at the martyrian on the day of my resurrection. Martyrs, we know as people who perished for faith, but actually Greek word is witness. So the stone itself became a witness to Lord's resurrection. So when you're coming to a martyr, you become the witnesses to my resurrection. You become the witnesses to what actually have happened, this emptiness of the tomb as a witness. And here we see different shapes of this holy place as it was throughout history, perhaps in Crusader period and then Ottoman period and much newer one from the 19th century and how it is looked nowadays. But this was the center of the universe. This was very important. And all throughout cultures, all throughout history, that tomb was replicated. It was the center of worship. It was center of devotion. It was the center of every people's imagination. Those people who were not able to come to venerate it in Jerusalem, they were allocated the uh, opportunity to give it in their home country. Over here, we see the presentation. And again, they corresponded to the era the, when they were built and to how tomb and Jerusalem look at the time. We see it in Bologna, in Italy, we see it in Austria, we see it in Germany, we see it in Georgia, we see it in France, we see it in Russia. And actually, even until the present day, in some newer churches, they build these replicas for those people who are not able to come to Jerusalem and who are not able to venerate the life-giving tomb of Christ. Again, coming uh, uh, to the words of Eusebius, it's New Jerusalem, facing the far-famed Jerusalem of all time, and the tomb of Christ is called the Holy of Holies. So we see the continuation of belief. If for Jews, the focal point of attention was the temple, and in the temple, the Holy of Holies. We see the same very language being applied and being used to the tomb of the Lord. There is no holier place than that. This is the essence of the promise that is given to us all. This is affirmation of our belief the emptiness of the tomb, to enter and to witness as to something that actually had happened. So all throughout history, you see here on the left-hand side is the different shapes as to how tomb and appearance of it have changed. What have not changed is the inner part of it. And the inner part of it is divided. If here as we see the plan, uh, uh, just a larger shape of the plan that you can see here on the left hand side you see two parts the tomb itself or the burial chamber itself a very narrow uh, strip where the digit number one is with this where the body was laid a little tiny corridor um, barely enough for three people standing and over here we see the vestibule of the angel and this you could see on this picture here vestibule of the angel and actually the um, place of where the body of Christ was laid, right inside this small edifice inside the large church. So it, in, in, in general, it repeats the form of this ancient Jewish burials that we just uh, talked about some minutes ago. Here we can see the vestibule of the angel. Why vestibule in the angel? Because faithful who come to venerate the tomb believe that this is part of that very sealer stone on the tomb or whatever left of him of it because the rest was taken out by the pious pilgrim for devotional we can see some people bowing there venerating the place of where the body of the jesus was laid so essentially it's this part over here um next to the uh icon of the uh risen lord so that's how the tomb looks today nowadays and you can see very um neo-baroque features classical feature features because of course 
what we see now and what we witness now is uh, 19th century. And sectarian division did not omit even this holy place. You can see that the um, marble piece that covers the bedrock on which body of Christ was laid, of course, nobody claims that this is exactly the stone on which the body of Christ was, is divided into two parts for Orthodox and for Catholic to have their services. But the tomb does not exi uh, exist outside the context, right? So it all happening in um, Jerusalem uh, of the first century AD. Um, and there is very little left from this period of time. Uh, there is a beautiful uh, scaled model of Jerusalem and the Museum of Israel. But of course, a lot of it is educated guess or, wish or even wishful thinking. So if we look at this plan of Jerusalem, here's the Temple Mount. Um, uh, the central focal point of uh, city of Jerusalem, or, uh, where much was developed, where sacrifices have been made. Next to it already is during the time of Jesus, uh, uh, the land of Israel, Palestine was conquered by the Roman authority. So so-called Antonia Fortress, where the um, Roman troop would be stationed. And if, if here on the plan, we see the Golgotha indicated here outside the city walls. It's roughly corresponding somewhere over here. Here's the close-up. These rocks is the representation of the quarry that was outside the city walls. And it's next to the road that led to the seaport of Jaffa uh, on the Mediterranean, right? So Jesus would be led out to the city and crucified to the outcrop that looked like human skull. And there is another legend associated that we're going to discuss a little bit further. And this as quarry was abandoned, it was expanded and some of the cavities were used as the tombs. But this is the city that could not be seen anymore except on this plan to whatever degree that it corresponds to historical reality. And uh, then already when we're talking about the Christian era, we also encounter different reality. In 70 AD, this Titus of Spasianus, uh, future emperor, the son of Vespasian, Roman emperor at the time in 70 AD, destroys the Jewish city entirely. He pretty much raises us from the face of the earth. And although settlers allowed to come back relatively soon thereafter, um, it's just a small tiny village and it's not going to be on time, the time of emperor Hadrian who in 135 AD decides to rebuild the city. And curiously enough, we have a bit of understanding how that city have looked like. This mosaic found in Jordan and Medaba from the sixth century, from the time of Emperor Justinian, mid sixth century likely, has a presentation of the Byzantine city completed already with churches. However, uh, Christians did not, Byzantines did not rebuild the city in, in to a large degree it remain a Roman city. And of course, key feature of it is the uh, uh, Cardo Maximus, so the main street, main avenue in the city that run all throughout the city of Jerusalem, Roman city of Jerusalem, from Damascus Gate all the way to the uh, Mount Zion. And here we see artistic rendition of that colonnaded Cardo Maximus as to how it have looked like at the time of Romans uh, in the second century, and definitely how it looked during the time of Empress Helena, and during the Byzantine rule, when St. Mary of Egypt and St. Sabas and all other Orthodox wonderful saints who were passing through Jerusalem all the way to the time when it's going to be greatly altered and partially destroyed by Persians and then altered during the uh, Islamic rule. And this, how it corresponds. Here we see this plan of Jewish city before Titus would destroy it. We see the uh, wall, we see the guarding tower, we see the uh, houses of the residents, we see a mountainous outcrop called the Golgotha, the place of the skull, and here we see the tomb of Christ. Over here we see the same plan, but it's already a scale model. Over here is part of the colonnaded street, and here a big square was a temple dedicated to Aphrodite, so to Diana in uh, um, a Greco-Roman cult of saints, and April Hadrian builds uh, a temple right above the tomb of Christ. Also, legend has it that he wanted to 
uh, as persecutors of the Christian to defile the holy place. And he built the temple right above the area of the cemetery, above the area of the great, hoping that it would ward Christians off and would defile the place. But it's already incorporated inside the Roman cities. That's how we actually inside the walls. So if somebody would tell you, well, how come the tomb of Christ is inside the city walls? As we know that hygienic regulations called for it to be outside the walls. Of course, city in the time of Jesus, Jewish city was differently shaped than the Roman city and certainly differently shaped than the city that we see today with the walls built by Solomon the Magnificent relatively late in the 16th century. So what Helena does based on her desire and on direction of Emperor Constantine, we see same outcrop, but it's just a close up. She builds the beautiful edifice, beautiful basilica, beautiful public structure that by then is widely used by Christians because all the Christians of the city has to be gathered in one place. So this beautiful edifice, the church of Anastasis or Martyrium, the place of witness Martyriums in early Christian era would be the place where the martyric remains, the relics would be placed. But here we see the different use of the word martyrium, right? It's a place of a witness at this point. And it is a separate building. Uh, there's an open courtyard with an out, outcrop of Golgotha with a silver cross mounted on it in commemoration of the uh, crucifixion of Christ. And over here we see the dome with the already familiar to us little chapel that marks the place of the tomb. Uh, likely that the dome was built a tiny bit later that was open to the sky, um, but then it would be encompassed into this one mighty complex. Here you see the scale model of how, based on the description of early pilgrims, um, uh, a jury among them, uh, this complex is described. And here we see uh, for the first time underground cistern where the cross on which Christ was crucified according to Patriarch Macarius and belief of Empress Helena was found. Again, the main entrance to the temple would be from this Cardo Maximus. This is a central focal, focal point, right? In 350 AD, roughly 25 years after this mighty complex would be finished, a St. Cyril, the patriarch or archbishop of Jerusalem, would be saying in his catechesis, now for what reason is the place of Golgotha and the resurrection called not a church like the rest of the churches, but a martyrion? It was perhaps because of the prophet who said, in the day of my resurrection, in the martyrion, in the day of the place of the witness where Christ would come back to life. Again, the place of the witness, but you enter it before you reach the Holy of Holies, before you reach actual tomb of the Lord. The church would be destroyed in 109 AD and Byzantine Emperor Constantine Menemachus, after a long negotiation with Islamic authorities, would start rebuilding it. But it won't be until the time of Crusaders, uh, after the conquest of Jerusalem at the very, very end of the 11th century, that early in the 12th century, the church would be rebuilt and it would take more or less the shape that is familiar to us today. Um, they tried to encompass, to include as many holy sites in the area as possible. So the Golgotha and the tomb of the Lord, the place of the finding of the cross and the place for the prayers would be all encompassed in the building that was actually much smaller that initial Byzantine Basilica. Over here, you could see cross section, again, with the tomb and with the, with the cross, with the Golgotha. And here, you see cross section as viewed from above. Here, you can see the Church of Anastasis and later Crusader rendition of it. And now that's how the church on the upper right corner looks today at the present as when we come and we're able to visit it. It seems to be very confusing because again, the question remains, where is the tomb? As you can see, the stripe picture, the uh, mountainous outcrop that, you know, covered in those stripes here on Golgotha and here around the tomb, that's actually the outcrop of this quarry that was taken away by Empress Helena. They chopped off these parts of the uh, cliff, leaving enough space around the tomb for the ceremonies, for the worship 
and of course singling out the Golgotha rock as well. Well, needless to say that many pilgrims that would be coming would chip off on the rock of Golgotha and take it back home as the greatest blessing, right? So that's we're coming to how the church look today. And as I mentioned, it encompasses many holy places, not only the tomb of Christ itself, but the Golgotha, the place where he was crucified. Now it looks like a very, very elaborate chapel. You uh, see the upper part where you have to come into the church and climb up some very high stairs in order to reach the uh, top of this outcrop. Look nothing like back in the day. Here on the upper left corner, you could see a little bit of a glass with the actually rock of Golgotha uh, showing through. And here there is a Greek altar. And faithful, as you could see here in the right lower corner, priest is kneeling and praying. There is a round opening where you could put your arm through and actually touch the rock of Golgotha. And here we could see the uh, an icon uh, of the crucified Lord with Mary and John, the theologian, standing on his right and left hand side accordingly, uh, gazing, gazing at him. So it's an iconic reproduction of this gore of events, what was happening uh, here um, some 2000 years ago, right? Um, but it's adored, it's beautified, it's glorified. And people come here to celebrate liturgy, to celebrate the suffering of the Lord. Curiously enough, the uh, under the rock of Golgotha, on this out of this outcrop, there is an open space. And already in Byzantine times, it was a belief that Adam, the first man, was buried underneath the place where our Lord would be crucified. And here are two images, two slides, and the lower uh, right corner represent this chapel of Adam. The general view and the close up of uh, faith, faithful are shown the tomb of Adam. Of course, to us, it's much more of a theological statement. If somebody wants to take it literally, um, nobody prevents people because piety is a great thing. But of course, for us, the theological understanding is by far more important. But interesting point to some things that you all have seen in the Orthodox Church is the big mighty crucifix with a skull underneath. That skull underneath precisely, precisely indicates the skull of Adam. It's not only figurative victory of Christ over some general death. It's precisely a restoration of the fallen Adam, a victory over death in the one through whom death entered into all of mankind, into all of descendants. This heel of an ancient rib, heel of an ancient division, uh, something that brings and ties all people together. Like an old, an old Adam, we all die. In new Adam and Christ himself, we're coming back to life. Another holy spot that is very uh, important. I'm not going to go through the entire uh, narrative uh, through the, uh, and every chapels, which are many inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but giving you the most significant elements, the chapel of where Helena found the cross of Christ. Now, it's very improbable, perhaps, that she found the cross in the shape of a, uh, of a T or, 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 or an X or any other thing. Most likely, she found the middle beam. And there is a miracle that associated with the story of how a sick or even a dead man was carried out, and they put several pieces of wood upon him. And when the uh, piece of wood touched the sick man or dead man that he came back to life, it was restored back to health. But this is the place in the lower part uh, of that quarry and actually it goes even deeper down uh, where it is believed that Helena in among the rubble was, was filled with construction material in order for the pagan temple of Hadrian to be built on top of it and when they um, cleaning the rubble they found that cross and over here we see the monument to it and there is an opportunity to celebrate liturgy there as well and it's immortalized in our tradition over here um, uh, Patriarch of Jerusalem, Macarius, elevates the cross, and we have the Feast of Elevation of the Cross. And here, Constantine, of course, he never been to Jerusalem, but it's under his direction that his mother, um, Helena, traveled throughout the Holy Land, building churches and the holy places where Christians venerated, uh, the, celebrated the memory of the Lord and venerated the miraculous events associated with the life of our Lord, especially associated with his was key events during his life, right? 
So uh, we have the Feast of Elevation of the Cross in September, but actually we have Cross Veneration Week during the Great Lent. And that's likely when actually uh, the cross was found, but because that feast was considered to be too festive um, of an occasion to celebrate during the Great Lent, it was moved roughly six weeks later to the celebration in September. Now, you could ask me, and what about the facts? You told us so much making careful statements according to the tradition believed. How do we even know without seeing the tomb of Christ that it's a place where he was buried? How do we know that this is the actual place? Okay, it was outside the city walls, not outside the city walls, but how do we know anything about this place? What is the evidence that this is the place besides the tradition that is of course remarkable and venerable and, and mighty, but where is the juice or meat or evidence? And it's actually very interesting because there is evidence to much of what I've been saying to you during the past hour or so. Um, during the restoration, uh, a family tomb, Jewish family tomb, have been found. It is believed to be the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, the holy mirroring men, because there were not only women, because there were men as well. Um, we have no proof of it. It's just the, of course, belief of holy tradition. It was destroyed during the building of one of the chapels of the Church of Anastasius of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. But we can see a very typical arrangement of those locally where the dead bodies would be placed. We even see something that may have been an ossuary. At the stone collector place when the dead matter would be clean of the of the bones. There are actually five locales in this tomb, but only two of them accessible. Others have been walled in. But this is evidence number one. There was a cemetery here during the time of Christ. Even we don't know how Helena picked up the tomb. Maybe there was graffiti. Maybe there was something else. It remained to be a hypothesis. But there was definitely a cemetery in that place. It's outside the walls, and there was a cemetery there during the earthly life of our Savior. Another very striking evidence came to light actually very recently, as recently as 1970s. During the restoration Armenian part of the church, uh, uh, there was a cavity opened and it has uh, some stone material. And part of the stone material were blocks from the Herodian time, but reused by the Romans on the building of the temple during the time of Hadrian. So at the beginning of the second century AD. And on one of those stones, a graffiti over here marked in black ink, uh, a picture of a boat was very interesting inscription has been found. Again, there was nothing known about it because it was covered by rubble. It was found in excavations. So that um, graffiti that is marked here in black ink for you so you could see uh, much clearer actually comes from some time before the Church of the Holy Sepulchre actually have been built. So in other words, it may have been drawn when the pagan temple was destroyed, or maybe it was even etched. Of course, it was not in black ink, it was just a graffito. When the temple of Hadrian was still standing above the grave of our Lord, which inadvertently says that Christians were coming to venerate that place as a holy place. And underneath the boat, there is this very interesting inscription in Latin, which means that pilgrims were coming perhaps from the West. Uh, not given, but locals, local pil pilgrims by that time, lingua franca of the area was Greek. So probably if they were writing in Latin, they came from the West. It says Domini Ivimus, which, which, says, which could be translated as Lord, we shall go Oh Lord, we went, or somebody even go as far as Lord, we have come. And in close parallel to the Latin translation of the rendition of the Psalm 121 or 122, depends on what translation and what version you follow. It reads, in domum domini ibimus, let us go to the house of the Lord. So it's obviously allusion to the pilgrim psalm that pilgrims would recite even as they were coming to the holy place, they were coming to the church. So here encountering the Holy of Holies, encountering the tomb of the Lord, 
even before the church is built, they're drawing the element, the ancient um, symbol of Christian church, which is the boat, right? The anchor is the cross, ancient Christian symbolism filled with it, but with this Latin inscription is probably also allusion to their travel to the Holy Land as they coming to the place which is not even signified yet as a single tomb, but to the area of it to pray. And another very interesting evidence comes when relatively recently and just in the course of last five years when due to structural damage, the Holy Sepulchre, the Kuvukulian had to be restored. For the first time in hundreds of years, the upper plaque over here in the lower picture from National Geographic, as you could see, was removed because they needed to conceal and restore the fabric of the rock that was underneath it. What did they found there? It was believed that they're not going to find anything. They actually found the bedrock of the tomb. They actually found the remains of the burial cave in which Christ have been laid. Since they disassemble and assemble many marble panels inside the Kovuklin, now there is no any kind of archaeological challenge to this likely being the place where Lord have been laid and where holy mirrors would enter and where John and Peter, with whom we engaged in the beginning of this lecture, actually have come. So we do have the evidence as much as we as inquisitive and educated people of the 21st century can look at this ancient matters. Of course, there is no time machine, there is no cameras, there is nothing as we could come to see the evidence that likely what Christians have venerated in the tomb of the Lord actually is his tomb. And the last slide during this presentation, I do appreciate your patience very much. I, in a way of reflection, in a, in a way of wrapping and summing up uh, as to what we've seen and experienced in anticipation of Lord's resurrection, I want to remind the most essential thing as to what we as Christians hold most dear, the truth the, of risen Lord, that empty tomb translates to us his accomplishment. And what is his accomplishment? Victory over death demonstrated by the destruction of the gates of Hades, the gates of hell. Here in the icon of resurrection, Christ in raiment cloth leading out Adam and Eve and all the prophets and kings of old who anticipated the salvation. Essentially, in this icon, there is all of humanity. His open tomb is an indicator. Where did he went? To what depths of the earth he went in order to rescue us? And material engagement and time when for us as material creatures is incredibly important, nevertheless have a bit of reproachment, a little bit, a little bit of warning, even as depicted on this ancient, but nevertheless I'm thinking they're very, in a way primitive and naive, but very beautiful representations of encounter with Jesus post-resurrection. Here we see Jesus appearing to Lucas and Cleopas. They did not recognize him. They did not recognize the idea. They did not recognize and recount of what he was saying. Their heart was inflamed, but they were not able to recognize him. And Mary Magdalene, the first to whom Jesus showed himself in the body, just saying, don't touch me. You know, appropriation of him, appropriation not of the message and of the gift that he gives to us all, but of him per se. A very human element, a desire to grab as little children, you know, the evidence, the proof. And here, of course, doubting Thomas, putting his inquiring finger into the side of the Lord. For all sorts, we could say that this is the house where apostles were gathered as described by Luke and Jesus stood in the midst of them. But for the sake of our argument, we could speculate this empty, empty sepulcher. We just visited, we saw that there is nothing there, instruments, evidence of instruments of torture, burial cloth, yes, all good things of our salvation, but tomb is empty. You're not supposed to look for the living among the dead. And here we're coming out of this empty tomb, desiring to put the finger inside of the cross, like doubting Thomas. And in conclusion, I really wanted to read a short, tiny paragraph from John 20, verses 26, 29, that very much applicable to us all who lived here in such a distant land from where all these events have taken place in totally different time and cultural reality, but nevertheless, message that certainly resonates with us all. 
And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then says he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust into my side and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas, because thou hast seen, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, but yet have believed. And that actually brings us back to the very opening of our session and to the witness of an empty tomb, to us running to see what? To see nothing material, but to see the confirmation, physical affirmation of the belief that we hold most dear, that Christ is risen indeed and his victory over the hell is actually for us to behold, to participate. And it's something that would lead us all, the believers, and to life of blessedness. Thank you for your attention. That wraps up my presentation. And I am open to your questions. Thank you, Father Ilya. I, I don't know if you can see me or not. It's a little bit dark here where I am. Yes, to... yes, I could see you very well. Okay. Um, if, um, if you have questions, those of you out there, I'm going to um, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. So if you have a question for Father Elia, uh, go ahead one at a time and unmute and you can ask a question. If not, you can submit your questions uh, in the chat and uh, I will I will uh, extend those to Father Elia. So, um, either way, does anyone have any questions? A lot of people have their cameras turned off, so even we could not see the raising of the hands if they would like. Oh, you know, I, I, I said it so that they can unmute, Father Elias. So yes. uh, um, if they wish to unmute, they can. And I'm watching the chat here to see if anybody texts anything. Uh, Uh, hello, uh, may I ask you a question? Uh, this is Igor. Wait, 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 one at a time. Yeah. One at a can. time. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead so, with your question. Uh, my question is about the column that in the entrance to the uh, this church, and it has a big crack, and people like put uh, some notes into that crack. And I'm wondering if there is any scientific evidence of how this crack appeared. There is, I think, a legend that there was a lightning or something like that. Right. Um, well, that uh, the column is actually very closely tied to the understanding of what the holy fire is. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, something that have originated. Uh, as a local practice of the church, uh -huh. have been given. Uh, Excuse me, uh, no. if you're not asking I, questions, I, if you can I have some question. of this to think, think of my questions. I know. Father, Ili Father Ilya, I muted you. Go ahead and unmute. Okay, all right. If you ask a question, please ask the question, but otherwise we'll be speaking together. So uh, it's uh, uh, the miracle associated with this column is, li is linked to the miracle of the Holy Fire. Supposedly in 16th century, Armenians took the hold of the uh, Kuvuklian of the tomb of the Christ and were praying there and holy fire did not descend there, but descend outside by cracking of the column and holy fire coming out of the column. Um, now, uh, without talking from both sides of my mouth, I have to say that there is people who challenge the miraculous occurrence of the holy fire that we always strive for something incredibly miraculous and uh, that's actually a representative or iconic image of the miracle of resurrection itself okay so nobody tries to persuade uh, anyone into disbelief but at the same time those who are skeptics are not persuaded to accept it as the gospel honest truth okay uh, so um this is the this is the thing so um the appearance, scientific appearance of the crack on this column have not been confirmed to my knowledge. 
um, this is the remove matter of faith and icon of faith. If I'll come across any scientific study about it and I'll try to look at it, I'll post on my Facebook page and that you'd be able to see. It's definitely shown as one of the holiest sites in particular for Orthodox, for I'm thinking Catholics and most Armenians and Copts, it's more or less irrelevant. Uh, but for Orthodox, it seemed as a proof of our creed, of our testimony, and uh, of our desire to come and to pray and to have the affirmation of this great mi miracle of holy fire on Holy Saturday. So I know that I did not answer to your question, but yes, there is such a column, and I am not aware if any scientific work was done on it. It's charred. The breakage in the column is charred. But what is the origin of that chard? Um, uh, it's 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 still remain to be proven. Father Ilya, Catherine yes. asked a question. She asked, "Can Father Ilya give a brief explanation of the current administration of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? I understand that multiple jurisdictions are involved." Well, uh, it's bad for an Orthodox priest to suggest a suicide, but that would probably be the way to go before you'll be able to understand how it is administered. Only through the grace of God. Only through the grace of God. And how that grace of God works remains a mystery. So that, <laughs> that's my complete answer to your question. But if being formal about it, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, divided into different sections. Um, since uh, I managed to, um, I did a very brief thing for, it was in the hour and a half, there was no time to talk about it. There are several keepers of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, all of that complex. And main ones that are inescapably present in all of the sites in the Holy Land are the Greeks, uh, Greek Orthodox Patriarch, Patriarchate of Jerusalem. They are actually in charge of Golgotha and the tomb of the Lord and main Kuvuklian, main uh, place where liturgies are celebrated. Uh, parts of the chapels, for instance, the uh, chapel on the way to where Helena found her cross and place where, as believed, Mary stood and gazed at her son being crucified on the cross belongs to Armenians. Armenians were very numerous in the Middle East, um, uh, all throughout from center of Asia Minor, all throughout the what's today Palestine, Israel. And their presence was very heavy in Jerusalem. So there's one of the four quarters in the old city is Armenian quarter, and numerically they're very far. So administered by Armenian Apostolic Church. And uh, also part uh, of it, significant part of it, is administered by Roman Catholics. And that dates back to the time of the Crusaders. Some properties, very small fraction, belong to the Coptic Church, uh, uh, which is... Christians from Egypt and somewhere on the rooftop there is a monastery that belongs to the Ethiopian church so these are the jurisdictions that are in charge of the church of the holy sepulcher uh, the worship on the holy sites are done in rotation and in the sultanic firman from 19th century there is so-called set status quo where nothing even the letter could not be moved <laughs> into the property of the other jurisdiction so it's to the outside and to the Western mind, it's incomprehensible. Even in order to re rebuild something or to restore something, you need involvement of secular and religious authorities and for all of them to agree on something. So you don't dare to come to the worship space if you are not, if you are not uh, part of this um, arrangement. Of course, there are times where general tourists could visit and pilgrims of all faiths could visit. Access to the church is open to all. But one particular denomination celebrate the service, it's their part. And those brawls and feast fights that at times you could observe on YouTube, it's precisely when the status quo violated, when the times of the services are interlapping. And Armenians are not cleaning the floor too fast, so we need to expedite. And of course, there is heated debate, and then they breaking the broom heads against the, the adversaries' heads and such. So it's not very pretty sight. But overall, as I said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. You can see liturgy going on, but Latins did not finish, so organ is still playing, and Greek salty tried to out, out scream the the organ. It's 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 a zoo, but it's a holy zoo, right? So, but doesn't take away from the holiness. Doesn't take away from the holiness of the place, nevertheless. Somehow, Lord, out of so many temptations and 
mismanagement that we create for ourselves as Christians there on that holy place has actually somehow tolerates it. So, but administration is belong to several different to several different juris, Christian uh, not jurisdictions but rather denominations, and Muslims do hold the key to it. Even since times of the uh, Islamic domination, there are two families that actually hold the physical key to the doors, and they always lock and unlock. But of course, it's not like they don't want to let anybody in, and they're not going to let you in. No, it doesn't work that way. It's very firmly arranged, and that arrangement is actually enforced by the Roman guards of today, by the very effective Jewish special forces and police that is present there all the time like temple guard. So there is opportunity for mischief, but it's more done for entertainment part, and then it's very, very quickly put down by the, uh, I don't know, I don't know if we call civil authorities, but for the sake of the argument, we can say civil authorities. All right, so um, there was a question I saw about the garden tomb and how Catholics could be yeah, that's, that's about the garden that's tomb. That's the next one. Yeah, you, you want to go ahead and read it, Father Ely? You want me to uh, read I, it? I cannot see it. I just saw it as it came. Please read it okay. to me and to other it's listeners a, so I could address it's a, it. It's a, it's a question. It says, how do Catholics believe in the garden tomb in light of the archaeological evidence for the Holy Sepulchre? Okay, let's be friends. Catholics are not our enemies uh, in that particular place and spot, okay? They're not. Uh, please don't burn me, but I just want to say it for the record. Uh, Catholics do not believe that garden tomb is the tomb of the burial Christ. They do firmly believe that it's holy sepulcher. In 19th century, Anglican, Protestant, uh, General Gordon came to the holy sepulcher and he was very tired of that nonsense uh, of the mass of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and com complete and Western and routinous. And he said, what madness, tomb has to be outside the city walls. And he went outside the city walls and I found the place that to him looked like a skull. And there was a water cistern turned tomb. And he said, huh, bingo, we found the tomb of Christ. It's more of an anti-Catholic in a sense of anti-traditional sentiment by some of our Protestant um, brethren and sister and so to say and if in fact not all of the protestants ascribe to it i know plenty of baptists who would go to the church of the holy sepulcher but for the same of aura for sentimental feeling they're taken to the tomb to the garden tomb and uh, i have to say i was shocked some orthodox priest who went on the protestant tours they would say um you know i still would like to go back because it's so peaceful and you can sit and reflect but it's not a holy place. It wasn't even a tomb during the time of our Lord Jesus. So you may not appreciate Orthodox or Catholics all the way you want, but historical evidence is there. If you want to see an illustration, yes, you can go to garden tomb, but it's merely like historical reproduction. In fact, on the territory of one of the hotels, there is tomb that looks very much like the tomb of Christ from the gospel. You need to make arrangement at the reception. You can go and check it out. Because in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you could not see the tomb, as I explained to you. It's a chapel, it's walls, there is people in funny hats, right? As uh, Fraser would say that, right? You know, funny, funny hats, orthodox hats going all around and things of that nature. So it could be overwhelming, but it's legitimately archaeological proven holy sites. And all the traditional Christian uh, denominations, I'm not talking about Eastern ones, Assyrians, Ethiopians, Armenians, obviously Orthodox, Catholic, Lutherans, you know, high church Anglicans, they all go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's, it's a, I think it's a travesty, you know, you may be or whatever formation you want, you can go to the garden tomb, um, but uh, uh, that's, that's historically irrelevant, that's historically irrelevant, it's just mere illustration. A garden tomb is not located in the Garden of Gethsemane. Garden of Gethsemane is in a slightly different place. Well, say different place altogether, whatever left of it. Garden of Gethsemane was a huge olive grove. Olives were sustenance of people living. It provides food, it provides lights, it provides medicine. So everybody who could would grow olive garden. So Gethsemane is a place of an olive press. So all of the slope of Mount of Olives, that's why I called Mount of Olives, it was covered, it was like a forest area, covered with olive trees. If you are in Greece or Italy, not as much, but Spain or uh, all of Greek islands, Turkey, the plenty of olive trees all over the place still grow it, you know, for production of olive oil. And, but it was, you know, you could be a very rich man because it was in high demand. Olive was in high demand. In fact, Roman roads 
you know, like adapt the highway system. We think we're so inventive. No, it was back in Roman times. Roman authorities was build the road, but they would plant olive groves next to the road. And people were given the parcels of this land with olives and they could collect olives and use oil for consumption, whatever form, or sell it. But in return, they had to maintain the road. Okay, in, but in return, they had to maintain the roads. The roads were in excellent shape, but it was a mutually uh, beneficial arrangement, you know, by the Romans. So I, I hope I answered to your question about garden tomb. Yes, it has no reality, but no, Catholics do not believe that it's the tomb of Christ. Uh, they believe the Holy Sepulchre to be very much the place where Christ has risen. You know, Crusaders, we entering in the Romanesque church. It has typical Romanesque shape. It's like a pilgrim church in France somewhere, or in Spain, uh, same arrangement, very much so, very much so. Yes. Thank you, Father Ilya. There's another question. Mm -hmm. It says, is the Western Wall part of the temple? So I'm not sure if that means part of the, the Jewish temple or part of the Holy Sepulcher, but that's the question. Is the okay. Western Wall part of the temple? Uh, no, it's not. And it's located in different part of the old city. Um, the Western Wall is actually a retaining wall of Mount Moria. Uh, it's Mount Moria is where uh, the Jewish temple stood. And since it was such a massive structure, it had huge retaining walls. So the Western Wall is actually um, uh, part of that retaining wall, right? It's what it's uh, Eastern, if I'm not missing, Eastern, Eastern Wall of that Mount Marie. It's not even temple. There's nothing left of the temple. In fact, it's very hard to determine because Islamic authorities do not uh, allow any uh, scientific excavations to done for political reasons. Of course, Jews want to pray, want to prove their continuity. So the if temple being the central piece, the focal point of, of the nationhood, right? So it's very essential to find it. And it's a big political quarry. Now you cannot do anything on the Temple Mount, but the Western Wall is the most visible and accessible site. But you also have triple gate through which Christ entered into the Temple Temple Mount. You do have it. You have the stairs which Christ have walked. We, there is a fascination, of course, because it's promoted by the state of Israel as a tourist attraction. Of course, it's an important Jewish site. But for us as Christians, if anything related to the Temple, I'm thinking the staircase and triple gate is even more important than the Western Wall. Right, the cornice from which uh, Levites were blowing shofar, you know, for the time of prayer. Uh, but again, I just read you from St. Cyril, from Eusebius, that focal point shifted. There is such a term in religious term as supersession. Without denying the privilege of the synagogue, Christians understood themselves as cross growing out of menorah. Um, those of you who have traveled with me to Asia Minor, have opportunity, a sales speech to go this fall in place uh, called Aphrodisias, uh, excuse me, not Aphrodisias, but Laodicea rather, where our Bible was composed as assembly of books in the shape that we know it today, less the book of Revelation, right across the street from the mighty temple that is still there, the basilica, there is a column with a menorah inscribed in it. And on top of menorah, there is a cross. And uh, very often it's viewed in the light of conflict between the synagogue and the church. That cross is actually stumbles upon menorah. But it's not superimposed. It's come out of menorah. It's logical continuation. Christians did not understood themselves as a division from the synagogue. They understood themselves as continuation of that religious journey. The, the people of the covenant, the story have continued. Thus, the early Christian interpretation, the Holy of Holies is the tomb of Christ. If temple was there for sacrifices, right? You know, for a mission of one's sins, what greater than the blood, bloodless sacrifice of Christ and tomb that seals this understanding that sin is ultimately forgiven. So uh, out of curiosity, I encourage people to go and check out the Temple Mount when we're in a pilgrimage in Jerusalem, but religious fascination is totally beyond me because if you adhere to your creed, the tomb of Christ is the essence of the core. There is actually a very interesting thing. There is a, a little, um, I don't know if it's made out of plastic or metal, but there is a piece of marble on top of it. It's called the uh, nuple of the world, the central, the belly button of the world. 
of course, it's moved all the time when there is a service going on. So it's a sort of a movable, movable belly button, right? But what's very interesting about it, so what's very interesting about it, there is this insistence, all the medieval maps, maps during the time of the Renaissance. Well, there was, what was in the center? In Jerusalem. Jerusalem, it was Christocentric, Jerusalem centric world, which when we're saying that Christianity have to be part of life, it can be religion, we completely culturally lost that notion. We, we, we deprived of that concept as to what to be Christian like, forget nation, the civilization, and individual, because we're everything based on Christ, not in a devotional prayer, but everything that surrounds you. It's, it's part of the, this long act of relation with the revealed deity. And the church, there was a spot, this belly button, literally belly button of the world, the center. Again, today it's a little bit movable, but it's still somewhere there, right by the tomb, right by the tomb. Father Ilya, there are many people uh, in chat um, thanking yes. you for the, for the informative presentation. Thank you. There is, there is one other question in chat, and I'll reopen the, the, the uh, mute shortly, just in case some other people have some questions. Please, if I, if I take the mute off, you have to let a person ask their question and not talk over Father Ilya because it, it's just a cacophony if we do that. This question, Father Ilya, uh, was asked, it says, uh, Father, when can we go to Jerusalem? Maybe as early as this fall. Oh, you, you uh, broke up. Say that again. I said maybe as early as this fall. Uh, they maybe. just started... They just started to let vaccinated people in, but uh, I'm going to use an opportunity now for a tour, but it may be way too early. Uh, I'm, I'm scheduling tours regularly to Jerusalem, but at this point, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I know that I, I'll, Lord willing, Lord willing, leading tour to the other part of the Holy Land, to Jordan, on the other side of the Jordan River, that people thinking that Jordan has nothing to do. It's, it was one land. You know, Jesus was baptized there. John the Baptist was beheaded there. You know, people, if they've heard of Jordan, they're thinking Jordan River or Petra. We'll go to Petra too, because it's a biblical site, actually, right? But that's a little bit more achievable because authorities letting foreign tourists in. Israel planning to let people in, but you need to be inoculated and what the protocols are. At the present in May, the opening is mainly for religious purposes and family reunions. So, and even if I'm planning to schedule it in this fall, and those of you who'd like to, you're most welcome to sign up. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on advertising, but be prepared that it may not materialize just yet. But I'm hoping there was vaccination going on, with protocols more established. Hopefully, already next year, we'll be able to go and venerate our salvation, and venerate the empty tomb of the Lord. We'll look forward to that, Father Ely. I'm going to go ahead and, and lift the mute on the participants again. Uh, if any of you uh, have a, a question, please try one at a time to ask that question and the mute is lifted. Anyone? Oh, I think I muted you, Father Ilya. <laughs> I said any comments if something wasn't clear or whatever, I. I was worried about the time and I wanted to you know, provide you with as much information as possible. I hope it did not become a cacophony of presentation, but- um, I, I, I think we did okay. I don't see any more questions. No, I just put you off the screen. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through. Thank you, Father Ilya, for your time. I have to say it's amazing to sit here and look at you on a 20 foot screen uh, with, with, my, with my people here. Um, Jim my Stevens- Jim Stevens is sitting behind me and he's not asking about Jerusalem. He wants to know when we can go to Russia. Now that I don't know. Well, same. 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 You know, and, and Simeon, Simeon's question is he saw the ad about your budget friendly trips to Mount Athos. He, you'll have to private message him and tell him how budget friendly they are. Okay. Thank you, Father Ely. We're going to clap here so you can hear us. Don't clap when you'll be going to church during the Holy Week. Please say a prayer for me and for my family. I think that would be the we greatest will, we will. that I ever could wish for. We will absolutely say a prayer for you. 
Thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. The, the FOCA is in your debt. I'm sorry about the little glitch we had. Not quite sure if uh, it was a, a, a Wi-Fi issue uh, on Father Ilya's side or an issue here, but we're sorry for that, for that bump in the road. We hope that it worked. I know there were a few of you that sent me an email saying you couldn't get into the Zoom link. Um, message me if there's an issue there. We'll, we'll take care of those problems. And uh, thank you again, Father Ilya. Bless, thank you. Bless, God bless you all. A blessed uh, Holy Week at Pascha to you, and thank you for taking us to Jerusalem today. Blessed, yes, I, probably it wasn't a comprehensive tour of all the sites in Jerusalem, but we would have been here till Pascha and not going to church, right? So, well, we have opportunity. Most essential, most essential, most essential thing, you know, uh, people say, those who travel to the Holy Land, that uh, narrative of passion and narrative of resurrection and even entire liturgical year is never the same. And I'm thinking that Holy Land is called Fifth Gospel for a very good reason, that it becomes on one hand all too real. And some people even disappointed as how um, really earthly it is. But then when you come back home and you're hearing the gospel reading, you just strike you in a very, very particular way. Um, you know, it's something that you absorb, something that you touched and something that you truly live. But thank you very much for thank attention. You, the little you. doggy over there too. God, God, God bless you. You God take care. You. We're gonna clap. We're gonna clap again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God All bless right. you. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. God bless you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.